Elena Ferrante's My Brilliant Friend opens with a brief prologue from the perspective of an Italian woman in her 60s who learns that an old friend has vanished, taking with her all her personal possessions and even cutting her image out of family photographs to fulfill a long-held promise or threat to disappear without leaving a trace. But she was expanding the concept of trace out of all proportion, the narrator tells us. I was really angry. We'll see who wins this time, I said to myself. I turned on the computer and began to write. All the details of our story. Everything that still remained in my memory. And so the tale unfolds, framed as a revenge narrative, or as proof that the past stubbornly endures and cannot be so easily eliminated. Indeed, in what follows, a central theme is the difficulty of escaping one's destiny, shaped as it is, not only by the past, but also by place and by class and gender. It is language, however, that emerges as a particularly significant battleground. And the question is posed as to whether it is enough simply to invert the hierarchies that condemn the dominated are best to accept and even love their fate. Maybe disappearance, dissolving all margins, fleeing the realm of representation is the only strategy that remains. Elena Greco, a narrator, and Lina Olila Cerullo, her friend, meet as young girls in a rough working-class neighborhood in Naples, back in the 1950s. Elena's father is a porter at City Hall. Lila's is a shoemaker. We soon meet a whole cast of other characters, the grocer's family, the carpenter's family, the owners of the local cafe bar, with a focus on the kids who hang out on the same streets, go to the same primary school, and in time become friends, enemies, allies, rivals, and even, as the narrative continues, workmates, partners, and lovers. The neighborhood is isolated and self-contained. Naples is a port city, but neither Elena nor Lina have seen the sea. For most of its inhabitants, the height of their ambitions, as post-war consumer culture takes hold, is to buy a car, a TV set, perhaps a telephone. But there is from the outset the sense that Elena and Leela are special, and that Leela in particular is exceptional. Leela is headstrong and tenacious, determined to carve out her own path. Although she was fragile in appearance, every prohibition lost substance in her presence. She knew how to go beyond the limit, without ever truly suffering the consequences. In the end, people gave in, and were even, however unwillingly, compelled to praise her. Leela is also brilliant in that she is intellectually precocious. At three, she has already taught herself to read, probably from the newspapers in which her father's customers wrap their old shoes. Later she applies for library cards for her entire family, and with them borrows and devours four books at a time every week, such that her illiterate mother comes to seem one of the library's most dedicated patrons. Elena, for her part, is inspired and provoked by Leela's exploits. Much of the book is an account of her efforts to keep up with her friend. Where Leela, le where Leela leads, Elena is keen to follow. If anyone can find a way out of the poverty and violence that surrounds them, it is surely Leela, and Elena plans to hang on to her coattails and come along for the ride. Yet as time goes by, the girls' roles start to reverse. 
at first imperceptibly, but by the end definitively, as Leela drops out of school and then, age 16, marries the grocer's son. A successful match in her neighbor's eyes, but hardly the fiery escape from her environment that her earlier trajectory had promised. The day of the wedding, she urges the narrator to keep on studying. At a certain point, school is over, Elena replies. Not for you, Leela says. You're my brilliant friend. You have to be the best of all, boys and girls. This line prompts a shock, that almost at the end of the book, the only time its title phrase is invoked, it should apply to Elena and not Leela. What has happened? We remember that the prologue had placed the older Elena in Turin, with Leela last seen still in Naples. How did the one manage to get out and not the other? Not least when Leela seemed most likely to overcome the barriers in her way. What holds Leela back? And what allows or drives Elena to flee? Pause the video and write down some thoughts. While you do that, I'll have a glass of cheap red wine. But I'll be right back. School promises to offer the most likely ladder out of the neighborhood. But Leela's parents are resistant to her continuing with her education. While Elena's parents are persuaded of the value of middle school, despite the sacrifices of time and money required, Leela's father says no, telling her brother in a refusal inflected by gender, why should your sister, who's a girl, go to school? In a fight not long afterwards, her father breaks Leela's arm. He had thrown her like a thing. She then goes to some kind of secretarial college for a while, but fails, claiming afterwards, I failed on purpose. I don't want, I don't want to go to any school anymore. Elena asks, what will you do? To which Leela responds, whatever I want. Yet, constrained by a lack of both money and education, financial and cultural capital, she and her friends are left only with different versions of what French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu calls the choice of the necessary, and its associated taste for necessity, which implies a form of adaptation to, and consequently acceptance of, the necessary, a resignation to the inevitable. The best they can do, it seems, is embrace their fate, fight for their own servitude. When once Leela, Elena and some others leave the neighborhood for a night out, they find that they are invisible to their middle-class counterparts. They didn't see any of the five of us. We were not perceptible or not interesting defensively laughing at the fashions and tastes of those around them. These working-class kids on the town finally do call attention to themselves, and a scuffle breaks out, Our laughter abruptly turned to fear. As she drags her brother from the violence, Leela has an expression of disbelief, as if a thousand fragments of our life, from childhood to this, our fourteenth year, were composing an image that was finally clear, yet which at that moment seemed to her incredible. Their entire education, formal and informal, is a matter of learning their place. You can conform by resisting, as Leela often does, or by betraying your friends and family, as Elena does, at least internally. When at the book's end, and at the height of her friend's wedding festivities, she suddenly sees her environment 
through her teacher's eyes. The plebs were us. The plebs were that fight for food and wine, that quarrel over who should be served first and better, that dirty floor on which the waiters clattered back and forth, those increasingly vulgar toasts. They were all laughing, even Leela, with the expression of one who has a role and will play it to the utmost. My brilliant friend suggests that the only real choice is whether to internalize class domination or to reject class belonging by seeing the world from the perspective of the dominant. Either way, you lose. In Ferranti's novel, there's no clearer marker of class distinction than language. The narrator consistently notes when characters speak in standard Italian, the national language, and a sign of both education and cultivation, as opposed to the Neapolitan dialect spoken, in fact, not just in Naples, but across much of southern Italy, mostly in the home or on the street. Many of the older generation have only a partial grasp of Italian. Elena's mother, for instance, summoned to meet her daughter's teacher, speaks in dialect bent into an ungrammatical Italian. By contrast, at one of the many points at which Elena tries to establish a claim on Leela, here as she feels threatened by a mutual friend in a competition for her affections, and aims to show that she is not like the other kids. She comes out unexpectedly in proper Italian, to make an impression, to let her understand that, even if I spent my time talking about boyfriends, I wasn't to be treated like Carmela. Elena and Leela then re-establish the exclusivity of their friendship, in part by reveling in and showing off their mutual fluency in the official language, reducing Carmela to pure and simple listener. These moments lighted my heart and my head, she and I, on all those well-crafted words. Italian here is quite literally a code, a password to inclusion that works by shutting others out. However arbitrary the difference between official language and local patois, standard Italian is, after all, merely the Tuscan dialect, raised to the status of national tongue. The distinction is very viscerally felt and reproduced. The choice of language, for those like Elena and Leela, with the facility to switch between the two, not only shapes the speaker, but also, it seems, determines what can be said. Dialect, in the novel, is repeatedly associated with insults and violence, while Italian is the medium for discussion of loftier, more academic topics. This linguistic hierarchy is, however, up for dispute. Late on in the book, Elena wants to discuss literature and theology with a schoolmate, but complains that, while in school he used a good Italian, when it was just the two of us, he never abandoned dialect. And in dialect, it was hard to discuss the corruption of earthly justice, or the relations between God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus. Turning then to Leela, I needed to express myself, my head was bursting. She's surprised by her friend's hostile reaction. For Leela turns the tables and inverts the binary. I saw that her eyes narrowed as when she tried to grasp something fleeting. She said in dialect, You still waste time with those things? We're flying over a ball of fire. The part that has cooled floats on the lava. On that part we construct the buildings, the bridges, and the streets, and every so often the lava comes out of Vesuvius or causes an earthquake that destroys everything. It is as though to speak in Italian, rather than dialect, is to miss what is most important, most material. 
Far from refined discourse and educated language providing a privileged standpoint as a basis for philosophical or political reflection, it is dialect that gets to the nub of things. There are microbes everywhere that make us sick and die. There are wars. There is a poverty that makes us all cruel. Every second something might happen that will cause you such suffering that you'll never have enough tears. And what are you doing? Dialect can also then be deployed as a weapon of the weak, as a means to undercut the pretensions of the privileged, or even to question, albeit also to affirm, the way that language is always a political issue. Similarly, Elena is brought in to settle disputes between Leela and her future in-laws as they go looking for a wedding dress. In doing so, she demonstrates the power of educated rhetoric. I set in motion a technique that I'd learned in school. I was lavish in setting out premises and the confident voice of someone who knows clearly where he wishes to end up. I said first, in Italian, that I liked very much the styles favoured by Pinuccia, the future sister-in-law, and her mother. Job done. As they leave the shop, Leela takes her friend aside. You learn this in school? She asks. What? Elena responds. To use words to con people. From start to finish, words are seen as threatening in my brilliant friend. We are told that the world in which the characters grew up was full of words that killed. Croup, tetanus, typhus, gas, war, lathe, rubble, work, bombardment, bomb, tuberculosis, infection. Yet there is something ambivalent about this malevolent vocabulary, in that it can also be used to recover the past, to rescue the traces of a formative friendship. The social world that Ferranti's novel depicts is deeply structured according to disparities and differences of class, gender, wealth, language, and so on. Yet even within these constraints, there is room for movement and life, not least the continuous game of exchanges and reversals that, now happily, now painfully, made the two friends indispensable to each other. But there is also an occasional glimpse at the possibility of more fundamental displacements, of tremors that could one day lead to an earthquake that might bring everything down. The word communism, for instance, figures as both stigma and potential resource. More mysteriously, both clandestinely and somehow beneath language, Leela sometimes experiences what she later calls dissolving margins, by which the outlines of people suddenly dissolved, disappeared, and in which she perceives unknown entities that broke down the outline of the world and demonstrated its terrifying nature. Perhaps, as this story opens, with her vanishing on a line of flight, Leela's own margins have finally dissolved, leaving her literate friend once more in her wake, frustratedly trying to catch up to her by writing their shared story. Thank you.